from our virtual studios in Darmstadt, Germany. <laughs> and still, like always, in Camarillo, California. It's time once again, ladies and gentlemen, for the Marketing Geeks. It is amazing. And I'm going to say, I, I, I want to I just break it up because we had someone complain that our our uh, intro was too long. I saw so, that. I saw that comment. Yeah. I'm sorry that you think our intro is too long, but I, we do have to talk a little bit about how, Andros, what are you doing in Germany right now? And how awesome is it to be in Germany in I'm crushing it, brother. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm crushing it. So um, instead of just talking over uh, the music, I'm going to sing. So without good, further good. ado, here go I go. Ladies and gentlemen, Andros Sturgeon, it's the marketing geek. Geeks. That's it. That's, That's right. all I got. And that's why I don't sing in public. But we do have a heck of a show. We have an amazing guest, and I am I am so thrilled that whenever we have guests, it just it just makes my heart sing. And this is a good this is a good one. I'm uh, I'm excited about it. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, once again, it's time for the marketing geeks. Hello, marketing everybody. Geeks. Uh, but before we get into the big, the big show, uh, we got to pay some bills. So let's do that real quick. And we're back. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, for, for, uh, bearing with us, but you know, uh, putting on the show isn't, uh, isn't cheap. So, um, the next, right. uh, our guest is, uh, he, uh, he is, uh, a, a huge, he's big in Japan and that is something you can't say about too many people. Um, he is a, uh, a keynote speaker and a best-selling author. Ladies and gentlemen, I, from Chicago, Illinois, I would like to introduce Ron Jacobs. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, how, how are, you, are you in Chicago right now? I am in Chicago where uh, it is sunny and uh, warmer than it's been for, uh, I believe, six months. Wow. Cool. Well, I am, uh, I am, I am uh, excited to have you on because you have quite a pedigree. And um, uh, before the show started, you were talking a little bit about you, you had, you, you've, you've, First of all, tell us a little bit. Give us your give us your background because uh, it, a lot of a lot of our guests aren't as influential as you. Uh, very few of them have best selling books. Can you give us give, give us a background and tell us why, like what you do and why you do what you do? Okay, uh, so. I'm, I'm CEO of Jacobs and Clevenger. It's an agency I started in uh, uh, 1982. Mm which uh, uh, we celebrated 35 years uh, just a couple years ago. My background is in uh, direct marketing. Uh, so I, I've always uh, understood uh, marketing in a little different way than it was uh, traditionally done through advertising. But today it seems much more like what I've always done. Uh, so I, I, I write. Uh, my book has been translated, as I mentioned uh, earlier to you, that uh, my book's been translated into uh, J Japanese and Russian. And uh, so I, I get calls from people around the world to come and talk. I, I have a kind of an other interesting sidelight. I work with post offices. There aren't a lot of people who work with post offices, huh. but I've consulted with uh, Japan Post, with China Post, with India Post, um, and uh, trying to help them grow their businesses or transform their businesses or modernize their businesses to accommodate uh, how direct marketing and direct mail are used in, in the uh, 21st century. And uh, uh, I, I've work with clients that are as diverse as uh, uh, insurance companies, big insurance companies like Allstate and Humana, and as interesting and diverse as uh, a company that sells uh, fireworks uh, to consumers at retail, has about uh, uh, 80 uh, retail stores um, for whom we build regression and uh, trade models uh, and target prospects. So uh, almost all of our business is built on uh, uh, modeling, uh, strategy, modeling, planning, 
and then execution. So real quick, so you, you mentioned that you're doing work for all these different post offices around the world. Yeah. So when you say you're, you're bringing them up to date on direct marketing, and I, I don't think we plugged the name of your book. I want to do that real quick. Your, your book was called Successful Direct Marketing. It's now in its eighth edition. You said you sold over 250,000 copies worldwide. And, um, and we'll talk, we'll talk more about the, the Japan story in a minute here, but uh, I, I want to hear, so when you say that you're updating these post offices on direct marketing, are you helping them to create programs that people like businesses can purchase through the post office and then they can send their direct mail or how, how does that work? Yeah. So, uh, so Japan post is a one example. Uh, Japan post is trying to better, uh, look for profit centers because direct mail, even in Japan, isn't what it once was. Uh -huh. So first of all, I help them sharpen their, uh, consulting game for direct mail. Here's how direct mail is being used. Here's how personalization uh, comes into it. Here's how it's more data driven, et cetera. Then here are some other profit centers that you can start to look at within your uh, organization. So uh, uh, about five years ago, I recommended that they start to look more at packaging uh, packages because uh, e-commerce was growing in Japan. And in fact, uh, they developed a whole program where uh, they were selling a lot of products to China and they developed a, a, a portal based on some things that we talked about, which allowed them to uh, uh, e-commerce marketers to now package and send product to uh, uh, to China in a much more streamlined way than it had been before. Okay. Uh, yeah, so China, I actually worked on the first database of consumers in China. And if you think about that, uh, who has all the names and addresses of people in China or the most, uh, it, of course, it would be the post office. But they had never used that for marketing purposes. And uh, we, I helped them to develop a way to add some of the demographic information that it they didn't have already on so they had the names and addresses, but they didn't have any census data or mm -hmm. the kind of information we use. Uh, so they're sitting on a gold we, mine over there. I mean, having everybody's yeah. name and address. Wow. So you got able to step in and, and take advantage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so we actually created a, it's a case study in my book where we, we actually created a, uh, a, a survey for the postman to give. They have postmen going to all the addresses and the postman actually created a survey where, where, or, or uh, didn't create it. They answered a survey about every house. You know, is it in a good neighborhood, a bad neighborhood? Is it a high rise, low rise? Uh, is it expensive? Is it, and, and, and basically backfilled all the demographic data that we would have on our database from census data. Yeah. It's a pretty, pretty interesting uh, challenge. Hmm. Wow. So, so I, I want to take one step back because, um, uh, first of all, if you can define for us the nature of direct marketing, because we deal with a lot of digital marketing in here. So, um, if you could just give us a little bit of history about direct marketing and where it's at, at this particular time, and just give us the definition of that for some of our younger listeners who may not even know what that's about or what a post office is. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, what is a post office? Yeah, what is a post office? <laughs> uh, they, they, I hear they sell stamps there still. The, the direct marketing has over a hundred year history. It goes all the way back to the uh, to the nineteenth century, where uh, catalogers first started uh, selling seeds and other products, and then uh, Sears and Montgomery Wards became. Uh, uh, catalog marketers of products. Uh, remember, there weren't oh, as many retail stores uh, at the uh, in the the nineteenth uh, century or early twentieth century. So, direct marketing uh, has its roots in in that, and it then developed into what in by the time of the baby boomers in the mid twentieth century was uh, uh, a pretty good business of selling products to consumers. Consumers needed products. They were looking for things. Uh, and uh, direct marketers started kind of selling everything they could. The idea behind direct marketing uh, or ideas behind direct marketing are, are that we identify people who will buy a product. We capture information about them. Uh, when they make a purchase, we record the behavior 
I mean, if you think about it, this is kind of what e-commerce is like today mm-hmm. as well. So uh, I have this long-winded definition, which is that direct marketing is the interactive use of advertising media to stimulate an immediate behavior modification in such a way that that behavior is tracked, recorded, and analyzed and stored on a database for future retrieval and use. So Ron, you you talked a lot about uh, direct marketing and I I had some questions about how direct marketing is being affected in the United States right now. Uh, I know that a lot of uh, marketers are moving into a direction of personalization and, and for a while, they had, they had, uh, people had said that direct marketing is dead in the United States, but I, I think it's making a bit of a resurgence. Um, and part of that is because of the personalization. So I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit and what your experience has been with, um, with all that. Sure. Direct marketing, uh, direct mail rather, peaked in the U.S. probably around 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But Surprisingly, our business has been pretty steady uh, over that whole time. So I won't say we we are doing as much direct mail as we were uh, years ago, but most of our clients uh, still use it. It's uh, something, frankly, all of our clients are, are using because it still works. But it's much more personalized. And when I say personalized, we're using a lot of the data that we have uh, to better uh, reach people. And, you know, it, it's kind of become a thing where we're, where you talk about people-based marketing or human marketing. But uh, the reality is the people who get uh, advertising and promotions and direct mail uh, are people. So they respond much better to, to relevant communications than they do to non-relevant communications. With variable printing today, we have that ability to now literally uh, personalize every word of a direct mail package. I wish I could tell you marketers are are actually uh, taking that to heart. I'll remind you that uh, you could personalize every page of a website or of an email. And I haven't necessarily seen marketers figure out how to do that. But uh, we we are doing a better job going from just uh, using demographic data to even personalizing uh, images. So we have a client uh, that sells the... uh, GPS systems for automobiles. These are the the systems that are built in. They work with OEMs. They only do the software part of it. The the systems are already in the cars, but they do do that. So we we do map updates for them, and we reach out to people who own the cars, and actually uh, try to sell them a map update about every two years. What we were able to do in a direct mail piece. Uh, because we had the VIN number for each of the cars, a VIN number tells us the model, the year, et cetera, we were able to use a photographic asset and show the dash of the car, which if, it may be a different way of thinking of personalization than you normally do. But, you know, everyone who owned the car could look at that and go, oh, yeah, that, that looks like my car. That's how, where I think personalization is starting to go, uh, because all the personal data we have seems to be the part that consumers are most concerned with, and we have to be uh, aware of that as well. Uh, one of the one of the problems with direct mail is tracking the uh, the consumer uh, reaction after they get the mail to it to like a point of sale. How do you track behavior? through direct marketing what's what techniques do you use for that well we, we we still we still kind of use a lot of the older techniques which is to say we, we're really counting responses it's one of the uh, issues we have uh going forward with with google analytics we love google analytics i love the source of traffic report that comes out of google analytics but google analytics doesn't pick up uh any sources of traffic that are non-digital uh, so we recommend to our clients often to to add a, a, a specific URL for programs, uh, which allows us to then track back to the URL and says, 
here's the 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 effort that was done as as part of a a, a program, and it's it's the direct mail. The other thing we do, uh, frankly, most of our direct mail programs have. Uh, landing pages now as response uh, channels uh, because, again, that's what consumers want. So the minute we can move someone from responding to a piece of paper to an electronic uh, way, then once again, we can start to track it. And I think that's one of the big differences in direct mail as it's done uh, in 2019. It is mostly drive to web, drive to landing page, drive to retail. Retail is still one of the big black holes, again, of tracking. But uh, the, the point you raised and the question you asked, really, we're pushing people off to websites and landing pages. So we're able to then to, to track the behavior uh, the, the same way you are digitally. And what kind of open rates are you, uh, do you usually track? Do you have any, like, whenever you do a, a, a mailing, what kind of uh, response do you generally get uh, in, in the grand scheme? Uh, it really depends on the the uh, category that we're in. In insurance and, and uh, financial services, uh, those response rates are three-tenths, four-tenths, five-tenths of, of a percent. Uh, very, very low. But for the highly personalized promotions that we do for a, a lot of our clients, we still see four, five uh, per percent where we're talking to customers, uh, where we're talking to prospects, maybe two to three percent, uh, easily doubles when you're talking to customers. So uh, there's um, the, the, the better responses come from better communications where we're talking, we, we know who the person is, we know what they've done, we know what they've bought before, and we're really trying to sell them uh, more of it. Uh, on the business to business side, uh, it, it can actually be a little bit higher because of the kinds of, of offers that are done. Uh, but, but on the consumer side, it's probably in the range I just uh, mentioned. Can, can you walk me through an example of um, a direct mail piece of marketing where it then incentivizes the consumer to then go to a landing page. Like what kind of offers are you making through direct mail to drive somebody to a landing page? I'm just kind of curious if you can give an example of that. Well, um, I, I mentioned, frankly, again, it really covers every, everything that we're doing, whether it's insurance, uh, th there are actually only a few th places where we're not doing it. So, uh, Medicare insurance. There, they like to talk to an agent. People uh, who are baby boomers uh, may want to talk to an agent. So that usually is drive to phone. But again, not paper, uh, drive to phone. But uh, I men just mentioned the, uh, the, the OEM uh, uh, GPS. All of that mm -hmm. goes online so that people can then order that product uh, on online. Um, uh, we ability. have a client uh, that but, only uh, exists okay, so online, I, I've got an online bill pay uh, company that is, uh, uh, is the bill pay back in for 4,000 banks. And for them, we, we developed a, a, a whole series of life cycle marketing programs, mostly email, but we've started to add direct mail into that. Because uh, uh, to the point I think you made a little earlier, what we're starting to see is a little fatigue with electronic media. So, again, this client only exists online. We're using direct mail to drive people online to either sign up or uh, to reactivate, uh, typically. So let me ask you this: What are the what are the incentives though that you're that you're using through direct mail? Are you, are you giving discounts? Like if you if you go to this website now by uh, typing in like the promo code on this piece of direct mail, you're going to save money. And and also, can you can you speak a little bit about what you're doing on the outside of the envelopes to help drive open rates? Because I know like for years, there's some companies that will send like a nickel in the in the envelope window, which I think is funny because I always take the nickel and throw it away. Um, and then there's people there's companies that uh, that will put like, don't do not bend. And now I see a lot of these companies that are making their documents look like they're like official tax documents. Uh, but you open them up and they're like those fake, you know, those fake checks and they're like loan companies. Are you doing anything like that to help 
drive open rates from direct mail? I'm curious about that. And then also, uh, what kind of incentives are you are you giving to get somebody to go to the website? So everything, all direct mail has an offer in it. And that offer uh, typically has an incentive or guarantee or something to get people to uh, to accept it. That's a basic uh, premise and a basic tenant of of direct mail. So it may nothing be nothing more than a percentage off or something or a low uh, point of entry to get started if it's a, a subscription or membership kind of program. So you're just trying to get people to maybe try it for the first month free or at a low cost. To, to answer your second question, though, uh, we have started to work with different size envelopes to get people to kind of see what's inside of it. Uh, we personalize the outside of envelopes. We often test offers on the outside of the envelope as well as on the inside so that uh, we see does that work. The, there's actually a name for uh, things that look like government communications. We call that an official look. Uh, and, and that's been a common uh, tool that's been used in direct uh, mail for literally for uh, probably 70 years. Uh, and it still works. We have another interesting client where uh, we actually send people a live check uh, as the response device. And the, the live check has real value. It's uh, uh has it's a membership program and the check is in the amount of i think the first month uh, although we test that constantly test is it you know it's thirty dollars the right amount is it fifty dollars to get people started they literally put the check into their bank and that starts them with the program the back oh, wow. the back of the check then has the uh, terms and conditions in the in a very small little area which is all we're allowed to to use for, for where they sign and and uh, they say they agree to uh, start the program and uh, and and that's how we get them in in that case we've used a bigger window to show more of the check to show people that it looks, you know, it looks kind of, it's a real check in there. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. So, so we, we use a lot of uh, little tricks and, and techniques, uh, some of which, you know, you could use in email as well. Some of which like a bigger window, you, you don't really have. Yeah. Well, I will say the reason I'm probably getting so many of those official looking documents, we call them official forms, yeah. is because it's tax season. So I'm sure everyone's faking government looks to get me to open them and it's working. Yeah. But I throw it away after. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, that's right. And, and, and when you say it's working, uh, it's not working unless you respond. Uh, well, that's true. It's working for the open, yeah, but not for the, for the open. Yeah. But, but, but unless you actually respond, that's, that's not it. And I'm not a big, I, I don't love those programs because they trick people into the envelope and I don't want to trick anyone. I want people yeah. to, to go into the envelope and actually go ahead and, and uh, go forward with the order. What a novel concept, not tricking people. <laughs> <laughs> now, Ron, is there, is there uh, particular sectors that seem to work better uh, with direct mail than others? Like what, what, what is the, what is the business that seems to have the best results from direct mail? <sighs> You know, I, I, I'm not sure if this is the business that has the best results, but, it, but insurance and financial services, credit cards, those are still the businesses that are the heaviest users of direct mail. Even though their response rates are among the lowest, they don't have a lot of alternatives. They haven't quite figured out how to get people to, to sign up for credit cards uh, and, and, and actually uh, reach people with credit data uh, electronically. So they, ha they have a built-in problem. Uh, so they still do a lot of direct mail. And you know, I, I mentioned, we, we work with some banks, we work with some uh, uh, insurance companies because they're still heavy users. But right now, the, the next biggest user, I think, are, are uh, uh, retailers who are using it not for response, but for drive, you know, drive to, to retail. Uh, and, and the reason they're using it is because it's different than electronic communications, uh, which people are used to using for websites. So if you want people to physically come in, sometimes you got to 
lay something in front of them. Uh, and, and, you know, people still are, there are, the Sunday newspaper isn't as big as it used to be, but there's still a lot of uh, retail circulars in a lot of Sunday newspapers. Same thing with direct mail. So, so we see, uh, we see retail, financial services, uh, uh, banks still being heavy users. And, and uh, what do you see? I mean, cause you know, there, there's, there's been conversations about how relevant the post office is in this day and age. Uh, what, what do you see the future looking like for direct mail? Do you think there's always going to be a place for it? Or as people become more conscious about paper waste and, you know, everything goes more digital, are, are people moving away from that? Like where, where are we now in that and where is it going? We're st- we're kind of at a, a stasis. Uh, it, it's not getting bigger. It's not getting smaller. Uh, you, you were right uh, to 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 believe that people are are just a little turned off right now by the amount of electronic communication. But what that means is people aren't responding to electronic communications as much. So direct mail becomes an alternative where people, you know. Can't uh, are, are responding because they're not getting as much of it. Uh, we see millennials actually being heavy users of of direct mail. That's how a lot of them uh, get into the subscription programs that uh, that be, were very popular over the last four or five years. I think that's a trend that's kind of waning right now. But mm-hmm. uh, but I I don't really see. Uh, direct mail volume going significantly down from year to year over the last three to three to five years. It's it's really been the same. There, there just are some marketers who don't have an alternative. Um, I'll, I'll point out that right now we're starting to see the growth of uh, of of CBD and and other kinds of of products that are literally prohibited from uh, uh, from search and other tools. Facebook won't won't take those products. So we're starting to uh, look at that. We have, I mentioned, we have a, a retailer of fireworks. They can't use search. They can't use any of the digital tools. So there's uh, always some businesses that can't use those things where, in, in fact, I think direct mail will be a great alternative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even with CBD, yeah, especially if you do like, well, I was going to say, instead of like, you know, you were saying you, you send a nickel, if you could just send a joint to someone, <laughs> uh, instead of the nickel, I think your response, uh, will be extremely well, hundred uh, percent open rate. <laughs> yeah. There, yeah. I, I may, uh, I'll, I'll float that idea to uh, one of our clients, uh, see what they, think. well, I, I was just going to say too, that, um, with CBD, for instance, I, I have a number of clients that I, I work with and, um, and a lot of the like MailChimp and some of the, a lot of the email marketing platforms don't even let them send CBD emails right now. Yeah. Um, because it's still kind of a gray area in the United States. It, 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 that might change in the near future, but there's only a few uh, platforms that will even support it. So yeah, there, there is a market there for sure. And that was the same kind of thing with cryptocurrency when it was big, like a year ago or two years ago, whatever that was. Same kind of thing, a lot of restrictions on email marketing with it, but I'm sure the direct mail was still a uh, an alternative um, there too. It is. And frankly, that doesn't make, you know, that doesn't give direct mail a better reputation, uh, no. to be honest with you. But it, it it is an alternative for markers that are legal and are offering products that they can't market any other way. Well, let's uh, let's switch gears a little bit here because I, I know that you also wanted to talk a lot about, um, get into some, talk about data. And I, I wanted to, to kind of just kind of um, have you get into that subject a little bit. And I wanted to hear about how um, your business is using data, how you're tracking data. And I wanted to, I wanted to hear a little bit about that right now. So uh, I, I kind of made that statement at the beginning uh, that we don't have any uh, uh, data scientists on board, uh, but everybody on my staff actually knows how to use uh, customer insights and trends and, and data Every one of our clients has a data-related goal, uh, whether it is, you know, based on response or something else. We, we're, we're looking at business outcomes. And I, I think I said this earlier, where we kind of see marketing and technology and, and business coming together. If you think about direct marketers of, of 100 years ago, they were entrepreneurs. Even, even in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, many direct marketers were entrepreneurs. They 
look for business outcomes. So direct marketers always have been thinking business outcomes, not vanity metrics, not how many likes did I get? It's how many, you know, how many things that I sell. So that's a built, that gives us a built in reason to better understand data and, and insights. And we spend a lot of time go, combing through our clients' data. We build models of one kind or another. I don't do that. My staff doesn't do that. We have uh, some modelers that we work with who, who will take our clients' data and help us uh, mine that data and, and look for the insights uh, and, and really try to understand it. I have a very strong feeling about data insights. Uh, I want data insights to be revelations. I want them to be paradigm shifts. I want them to be something that we're able to look at the data and say, no one's thought of this before. Give, show us something that really can make a big difference for this client. Double response or, or, or really make uh, what we consider to be a, a, a much bigger splash than than they have in the past. And as a result, we really look at the varieties of data that are available. And there's a lot of data. I mean, almost every customer has data. I, I know that we're getting into a world of AI and, and big data, but the reality is that most clients aren't even using what I would call the small data that they have, the, the personal information, the name address, the behavioral information. It, when I talk to people, I, I say, look, we're, we're able to now get intent data uh, by looking at search and, and by looking at websites and how, are, how long the dwell time is. So we're kind of crossing over into that, but we're then mailing people based on their digital behavior as well as their uh, uh, physical behavior. That to me is where uh, our business is, is going. And we spend uh, just incredible amounts of time building models and, and targeting people because, again, we, we really want the communications to be relevant and we want to give our clients the best chance of a higher response. Absolutely. Now, uh, it's, it's interesting because I, I think I'd mentioned um, before we started recording, I was mentioning that I was over at a conference. It was Social Media Marketing World about two weeks ago. And one of the speakers there, I'm blanking on his name right now, but he ran a, a, a Google um, agency out of Australia. And he was, he was talking a lot about AI and, and how Google is implementing AI in their business. He, he talked a lot about how the um, search intent um, algorithms are getting so advanced yeah. that they're, they're getting very good at predicting when somebody's going to buy even. Yes. Um, and then he also said that something I found pretty interesting is that in the age of AI, um, a, the companies that have the best data and are keeping the, um, yeah, they're, they're keeping the best records, keeping the best data are the ones that are going to win in the age of AI because the, the systems are going to be able to, to comb through that data and create incredible, um, you know, incredible insights from it automatically, but you have to have the data to, to get it to work. So that's, I found that kind of interesting. So I think you're in the right, uh, in the right field right now from, uh, from what he was saying. So, uh, I think we are too. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I mentioned that we do a lot of digital work as well as, as traditional direct mail work. We do tend to do direct mail for all of our clients, but, but so many of them are also using digital channels that I think it's really harder and harder to, to uh, distinguish between the two things. To me, they, they seem almost the same at this point. Now, one of the, one of the things that uh, Justin and I always talk about is the rule of seven, that it takes seven exposures to your brand through various channels before someone takes a, uh, makes a move on it or, uh, or, or does something, a uh, call to action. And, on average yeah, yeah. and so so uh, you know how do you think that that uh, direct mail and uh, using this kind of data is essential in that or or does it have a, a more powerful effect well sure uh, the, the reality is I, I I believe very much the same way you do. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a rule of seven, but I can tell you that uh, many of the programs we do for clients are uh, what I would call life cycle marketing programs, where we'll create four efforts or five efforts at the acquisition stage. We'll 
uh, move people from acquisition then to uh, to onboarding or to welcome, then you know activate them after they've done that. And and we're not leaving anything to chance, and we're creating four or five efforts for each of those uh, specific life cycles. So we have one client where I think we have five or six uh, different streams uh, where we're using uh, a, a kind of marketing automation where some of it's direct mail, some of it's uh, uh, email. Uh, again, I'm 100% with you, but the data is what allows us to drive that. Uh, and by having the data, knowing where pe what people have just responded to, we're now able to move them over into that next channel uh, or that next uh, th that next series of efforts. So uh, we're we think this is exactly the right way to 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 go about marketing today. So uh, I'd like to know a little bit about your book and uh, tell can can you tell us because uh, you said it's been uh, translated a a little bit and and in and, uh, in, oh, yeah. and in Japanese too. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, that story? But also, I'd like to get into the meat of your book and kind of break down exactly uh, what what you go over in 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 the book that you have. Okay. So uh, the the uh, I'll start with the last first. Uh, the, the book actually is about six or seven hundred pages, um, but there are whole chapters on data, on mailing lists, on offers, uh, offers and incentives. Whole chapter on that. Uh, a whole chapter on uh, CRM and customer relationships. A whole chapter on on building uh, a multi-channel campaigns. A whole chapter on business to business marketing, uh, lead generation. A chapter on uh, on some of the other channels. Three or four chat. There's actually three or four chapters uh, on on the di different digital channels on e communications and e commerce. Uh, we still talk about telemarketing. Uh, so w we really get in depth on direct mail. Uh, there's probably four or five. Uh, separate chapters that cover different aspects of it, from the creative side of it to catalogs, uh, etc. And uh, and and then of course uh, uh, research and, and and testing as well. We, you know, we call them marketing experiments, but testing is something that uh, again we've we've been doing in direct marketing for for years. We've always done what would basically now be called an A/B test. So. When when uh, the person who trans the last translation of the book was in Japan about four years ago, and when the translator was going through the book, uh, he he called me from Japan and said, "I want to change the name." And uh, when, when you sell the rights to a book, they have the right to do a lot of things. Uh, and clearly, I don't read Japanese very well, so I wouldn't know whether they changed the most of the copy or not, but I would get that they changed the title. Uh, and, and he said, well, I really want to change the title. That's why I'm calling you. And I said, well, what do you want to change the title to? And he said, well, I want to call it uh, The Marketing. And I said, The Marketing. Let me think <laughs> about that for a minute. Um, and, and his rationale was pretty simple. He said, everything in your book is really what we're doing today in modern marketing. It's how we're doing marketing in Japan. And it's, I think, how we're do, you're doing marketing in the rest of the world as well. So it, it was really a, kind of a wake-up call. And it's actually two volumes. And, and I hate to, uh, to make the point any further, but it, it's actually kind of Bible-shaped. So, you know, here in the U.S., I'm like, I'm known as uh, a, a big advocate for direct marketing. But in Japan, I'm known as the author of The Marketing. And <laughs> <laughs> so it, there's a great reverence. And uh, one of the firms I worked with there uh, gave me really a high honor uh, and, and a very unusual honor as well. They, they asked me to sign the front of, of a copy of my book. And no one ever asked for that. You always write on the inside so that it doesn't yeah. get smeared. And uh, about uh, three months later, they uh, they sent me pictures. And they had built a new headquarters and just had moved into it. And they had a conference room where this book was in a plastic case in the conference room. 
And then they showed me the name of the conference room, and it was the Ron San or Ron Jacobs conference room. They call me Ron San there. So it was the Ron San conference room. And I, I frankly, I don't know anyone else who's had a conference room named after them. Uh, <laughs> but, but I gather that must be a very high honor in Japan. It sounds like it. I think I was mentioning it's like you have like a shrine to you over in Japan. So you're, you're like a... That's pretty cool. It's a very high honor. Yeah, it, it awesome. really is. And and I've got and I I go there for for two or three weeks at a at a time and do uh, just a, a whole series of seminars on on a lot of these very same things that we've been talking about uh, today on 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 uh, on the podcast. Very very cool. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, I'm I'm actually speaking uh, in two weeks at a content marketing conference in Boston on AI and and how AI is actually uh, starting to be used. And one of the things uh, I really uh, I use quite a bit is is text mining because I really think uh, understanding. Uh, how what words people respond to, what words uh, they're keying on is really really important. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, a place where I think direct marketing and and digital marketing have a wonderful overlap. Uh, so you know we're starting to take that a little further with AI into competitive analysis uh, uh, and 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 other uh, uh, similar kinds of tools. I mentioned that I think marketers aren't using the small data they have well enough. Uh, so for most marketers, I think they still need to focus on that. But boy, big data al allows us to do uh, some very, very interesting things. And uh, I'm going to talk literally at this conference about all the marketing use cases I see for AI right now. So can you uh, just talk about text mining for a, a second here? Because I don't think a lot of people know what that is particularly. Can you just uh, give an explanation about that real quick? Yeah, sure. We we actually are able to go in and and look at uh, uh, the the words people are using either uh, di mostly digitally right now. So we're going in and mining the search terms, the reviews, all the places people are talking, uh, all the social media sites, and we're trying to better understand on our clients' behalf what people are talking about as it relates to their brands. So text mining allows us to identify 20, 30 keywords that they're using uh, or 20 or 30 ideas. Uh, it could be that, in fact, they're pretty unhappy with, with something. Uh, uh, a couple years ago, uh, 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 Olive Garden uh, changed the way they were serving breadsticks. They breadsticks have always been free at Olive Garden, but somebody decided we they were giving away too many breadsticks. <laughs> so uh, they said uh, all the waiters have to now give one breadstick per person at a table plus one extra one. The waiter oh, that, that doesn't fly. That wouldn't fly with me. That's just not cool. I, did, did they change well, that already? I, I don't. So, know. That's an American. <laughs> so. Text I mean, mining was done of on glass door of the reviews that the 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 staff were giving to Olive Garden. Probably death and threats, right? Death threats. Oh, the death threats. They hated this idea. <laughs> it was the stupidest idea. Any, I mean, that's what they were saying on glass door. And using text mining, we're, we're able to go in and and learn this and go back. You know, go back to Olive Garden and say, "Hey guys, this is really your your customers hate it, and guess what? Your staff hates it too." Yeah, because the because the staff is going to hear either the customers are going to play into the staff, and they don't want to they don't want to <laughs> listen to that. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So this is a real this is a, a a real world example of how text mining was used. So so what kind of tools would you use for text mining? Uh, just in general, like for for or big data um, for someone who's like a, maybe a smaller agency or, or working for a company, what kind of tools would you recommend? Well, we, we will use just uh, literally uh, some very basic text mining tools. Uh, I'm trying to think of what tools we used and, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now, but there, uh, uh, there's a, about eight or 10 small business AI tools that almost anyone can use. Uh, and, and they're, they're really not that expensive. I, I wish I could help you. I, I'm I'm sorry. I'm drawing a blank. 
That's okay. That's okay. We, uh, you know, we, 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 want, we would love to have you back on when um, I don't have uh, as many technical issues, but um, uh, this has been really, really fascinating. Anything else you want to plug before? Uh, uh, where can people get the book too? Why don't, yeah. you, why don't you tell people where they can get the book and is it available? Um, yeah, uh, books, uh, Successful Direct Marketing Methods, 8th edition is available on Amazon. It, it, it's a few years old. I'm, I'll tell people that now, but the, the tools and techniques of direct marketing really haven't changed all that much. So uh, you can buy it on Amazon. Perfect. Yeah. Is there nice. any, so you're going to be speaking next week in Boston on AI. Anything else you wanted to plug here before we, uh, uh let's see, that's in two weeks. Next week, I'm talking, uh, to, uh, a, a group on variable data printing. And I think, uh, the week after that, I'm, uh, uh, I've got a, a presentation I do on, uh, the essential skills every marketer, uh, needs. And, uh, those are all areas that, uh, I, I keep trying to reinforce today. And, and where uh, where can we find you? If it, any of our uh, listeners want to do some uh, direct marketing, where can we find you? www.jacobsclevenger.com. Great. And uh, that's that's awesome. Well, this has been, will, will, you, will you come back and uh, uh, talk again? I'd be happy to. That is amazing that you would actually do that. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, uh, we could talk more about AI. We'll go like full uh, into the AI conversation. Yeah, and and, uh, right. and and before you go, tell me what do you what are you most geeky about? What 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 flips your geek switch? Anything. It doesn't uh, have to be marketing related. TV show, okay. books, music, cars. Cars. Uh so uh two years ago, uh or a year and a half ago, my wife got a Tesla Model X. Nice. Uh and uh we have a condo and a house and uh, our house is about 150 miles from Chicago. So we got a Tesla that would get us to 200 miles. Uh, but we've already learned that, you know, when we want to go 300 miles, then we don't have an extension cord long enough. So uh, uh, plus uh, my parking space was 550 feet from the electrical room in our condo. Do they have a lot of Tesla charging stations out there in Chicago? Cause we have them like everywhere here in California. Uh, I park uh, next door to my office and uh, in the garage I park in, they've got them. Okay, cool. Uh, but I, I still wanted my own. Uh, so I put the plug in and uh, at the end of the year, uh, I took delivery of a brand new model three, uh, the performance version of the Tesla Model 3. So mm -hmm. we now have two uh, Teslas. Very this nice. one does go 300 miles, uh, the second one. And uh, and I'm geeky about those cars. What do you think of the Model 3? Because I, I haven't actually talked to anyone that actually received theirs. I've, I've heard a lot of people that have ordered them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what do you think? Well, zero to 60 in 3.1 uh, seconds. Uh, I had a Porsche before this. Uh, the Porsche, I felt like I was one with. Uh, the Model 3, would I put my foot on the accelerator or well, when I put my foot on the accelerator, I just hang on for dear life. <laughs> <laughs> ludicrous speed. Ludicrous speed. <laughs> With that, <laughs> ludicrous mode. Well, uh, thanks, uh, Ron Johnson and everybody. I so appreciate you uh, coming aboard. And uh, yeah, we'll have a lot more questions for you next time. Um, but uh, you can get his book on Amazon. We'll put some links below. And... Wow, that was interesting. I uh, I can't believe that guy actually uh, have listened to our show. That's amazing. He's a big deal. Big in Japan. Big in Japan. He is. Uh, we uh, we got some geek news though. Oh my god, this is uh, this is big. The uh, did you did you see it? You know what I'm talking about, right? Oh oh, I saw it. I saw it. You better believe it. And and we're talking about, of course, the trailer for the Joker. Uh, let's do a starring, breakdown real quick. Starring Joaquin well, first Phoenix. Of all, Joaquin Phoenix has taken on the role of the Joker, um, held by a, a number of well-renowned actors, including, uh, the late Heath Ledger, uh, Cesar Romero, Jack Nicholson, uh, and now Joaquin Phoenix steps into the role. Uh, it looks interesting. I will tell you this. It, it does not your traditional superhero movie. It's not your traditional comic book movie. It, uh, and the way it's described is more like a character study and it's like a descent into madness. And I mean, I love Joaquin Phoenix. I love the concept of this thing. Uh, the preview is kind of dark and gritty, 
And I have very high hopes now. The trailer well, looks if great. All I can say I'm is looking that forward it, to it. I have no idea what to expect. If directed by David Lynch, I would have definitely, this would have been the movie of all time. But uh, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, no such luck. It's directed by Todd Phillips, who directed The Hangover and Old School. Yeah. <laughs> and so, The Hangover 2 and The Hangover 3. <laughs> now, now, one of the things that worries me most about this is that uh, in an interview with, uh, with Joaquin Phoenix, he mentioned that every day, like they're <laughs> rewriting right. the script as they're filming. And every day he would get the dailies. <laughs> I don't think it was Joaquin that mentioned that. I think it was somebody yeah, on that, the staff that mentioned that. They're like, yeah, we're pretty much rewriting the script every yeah, day. That, we have no that, idea what we're doing. You know, that that doesn't <laughs> bode well. So, um, you know, the, the, the biggest trouble I have with uh, the idea of a Joker movie, though, is the fact that part of the charm of the Joker is that he, he's a mystery. He doesn't have a background. Uh, I, I think that that to explain his origins kind of ruins the whole premise uh, of, of, of the, the character itself. It's like when they did that with Han Solo, there was, there's no point to it. <laughs> Don't, sorry. You, know? you just made me laugh when you talked about Han Solo. Why? Because that movie is so <laughs> terrible. And I, I've, we already talked about, I've already said this so many times. I don't even need to say it again. They gave a backstory to his last name. They gave a backstory to why he calls Chewbacca Chewy. And it's, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that, it's just, that, uh, it just makes me laugh. Well, I, I, it's just, you know, the, it just that the movie was so bad, they canceled all other like future Star Wars movies. Although I am looking forward to um, the, uh, the Game of Thrones showrunners doing the Old Republic series. And that was just announced. Um, so is I that a that movie or is be, that like a TV series on the Disney streaming? It's going to be a trilogy. It's oh, okay. Be, that's the one that Ryan, or, is it Rian Johnson or Ryan Johnson, whatever the, the one that the, uh, Johnson, I've heard some people say they don't even yeah. like to say his name out loud right now, but that's the one that Ryan Johnson was supposed to do. <laughs> um, but then after everybody in the world turned against him for, for good reason. Um, yeah. He got fired. Yeah. Well, if you say Rain Johnson's name uh, three times in a mirror, then uh, you'll, the Chewbacca <laughs> will show up behind you. It's not Chewbacca. It's you know, what'll happen is Luke Skywalker will milk an alien and that milk will get in your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> or something with that but, and with that once again another fine episode of the marketing geeks comes to a close and just so you know because i don't know if everyone knew when we were talking about data earlier we're not talking about brent spiner we're talking about actual data like like the actual ro- AI robot from start like the act not the, the actor yeah exactly but the actual AI robot exactly where I was going with that we're not talking about the actor Brent Spiner we're talking about the real thing we're talking about like what would happen if data jumped out of the screen from Star Trek and was in your living room that's what we're talking about or or went to Congress and started talking about his business Facebook to <laughs> senators. <laughs> Man, are we represented by some smart, smart people. Uh, <laughs> and by smart, you mean, I don't know what you mean. Pretty much the exact opposite. I, <laughs> I love this show. Help us out, folks. Uh, recommend this to 500 of your closest friends. Leave a review. Leave, give us feedback. We want to know yeah. what you think. Give us more of those uh, negative reviews. We like those. Yeah. Well, Justin likes them. <laughs> And with that, everybody, once again, we come to another fine episode of Marketing Geeks as it closes. Marketing Geeks, stay classy.